Good afternoon. This is uh, the second of these sessions. Um, this was going to be called Hardball with Hitchner. Um, we're going to call it Hardball without Hitchner. Um, Jim Hitchner uh, had uh, bypass surgery, as you all found out last night. Um, he's doing great, but he couldn't make the conference. So um, I'm going to fill in for him. My name is. You can't hear me? Your mic's not. Hello. Hello. You can hear us. Test, test. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Did you turn it on? No? Uh -huh. Okay. There you are. All right. Everything I just told you apparently wasn't important because I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> um, welcome to uh, um, the session where you get to stump the panelists. Um, they didn't know that that's what this is called, but there it is. Um, we have Rebecca Smith and Karen Casino up here ready to answer your questions. And let me just, before I do an introduction, um, of the three of us, uh, let me prep you for what we're looking for. Um, we're happy to talk about cost of capital, discounts for lack of marketability, um, benefit streams, um, damage calculations, but you're going to have to ask those questions. And if you don't ask those questions, what I'm going to ask is a lot of practical questions, practice management type questions, um, uh, billing practices, how you transition from a part-time um, valuation practice to full-time, those kinds of things. So if that's not going to be interesting to you, get to the microphones um, and ask different questions. Or if uh, you want to um, jump into that kind of a, uh, of a discussion with your questions and comments, obviously this is for you. So um, I think the three of us would say that we want this to be helpful to you, practical for you, um, and worth your time at five o'clock on a Friday night, and we are impressed that you are here. So uh, let's jump into this. I, I did tell you when you couldn't hear me that my name was Chris Hamilton. I should probably repeat that. Um, we have to my left, your right, Karen Casino and uh, Rebecca Smith. Karen is um, um, from San Diego, Southern California, my, my stomping ground, the better part of Southern California and uh, everybody wants to live in San Diego. She's also new on the EAB, the um, Executive Advisory Board of NACFA, so she's um, very involved, and most of you probably know who she is. Rebecca is the new chair of the EAB. Congratulations. And uh, so I'm gonna let them talk for a, a minute here, tell you about their practice, what they do, and then we'll jump into some Q&A. So if you wanna start moving to the microphones, um, I, we would love that, go ahead. Okay, well, it's not really called stump the experts. Just let, let's just be clear. It, it's more ask questions of us. Um, hopefully, we're not going to be stumped. But no. I, I, I have been doing this work for too many years. I think it's going on 30 years. Uh, and I have done damage calculations, family law, business appraisals, fraud investigations, pretty much... Uh, I don't want to say everything because we, we, we think we've seen everything and then we see something new. Uh, so uh, in California is, of course, a bit different than other states and other practice areas. So I think what you'll see, too, that, that Rebecca and I and Chris, you know, have different, there's different ways of doing things in certain areas. So there's, so, so there's, there's good questions you can ask us about, about that stuff. Um, and I, I always tell people uh, that, that transitioning into full-time forensic accounting slash litigation, uh, maybe why you're here, is, is usually a good move for most people. I've seen over the 25 years I've taught for NACVA, I've seen so many people uh, start out as general practitioners and move into this area and have done it very successfully. And it's always nice to see you guys back at conference every year and touch bases with you. So, uh, so, so you can ask questions about that too. I'm Rebecca Smith and uh, I'm from Columbus. Nah, I'm not on. We need a microphone. Hello? Is it turned on? I don't think I mean, I have it turned on. Yep. Ah, there we go. Much better. Um, I'm Rebecca Smith. Uh, I, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I'm with a firm there. Uh, we've got about six offices and, and about 200 people, and I run our forensics and dispute advisory practice. Um, my career now is 100% uh, people, you know, litigation uh, types of 
things that are in dispute, forensics. Um, I don't do any more traditional valuation. So if you think you're going to ask me about cap rates or something really technical on valuations, I am going to defer to Chris Hamilton, who will then defer to Karen, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, uh, I also am hoping we don't play stump the panelist. Oh, come on. All right. Let's, let's start off. Uh, nobody's at the mic. Uh, there is somebody at the microphone. Okay. Go ahead. Great. Uh, Karen, I just attended here. I told you what a, I thought you did an exceptional job of uh, forensics. And um, my question to you is, if after you've satisfied or you've done the best job that you could to figure out that there were there are perhaps uh, irregularities in the financials, and you've satisfied yourself that you've got the best best income stream that you can establish, uh, how do you? address the specific company risk? Does that give you pause or does it give you the ability to increase specific company risk because perhaps that even though you're satisfied that you've got the most reliable income stream that you can possibly come up with, it may not be completely accurate so you'll adjust it specific company risk. Oh. Um, good question and, and I'll be interested to hear Rebecca's view on this too. In, in my mind, um, there are two different things. Um, certainly if a company has completely fabricated books, um, that is a risk, right? But, but I don't know that it directly impacts the um, ability for that company to operate and to, you know, uh, directly affecting the, the value of that company. I mean, in my mind, there are two different things. Once I get the income stream as, as correct as I can make it, um, and then we, are, we plug it into the business appraisal and then I'm doing the build up method normally and I'm figuring out the company specific risk. I normally wouldn't account for the fact that their books are bad because I feel like I've already done that. Like I said, if it impacts their ability to manage that business because they have no idea what their profitability is and, and, and that reflects poorly on management, that would affect it. But typically I, I don't really think that it affects it specifically in that area. Do you, Rebecca? So the situation, I, I, didn't, I didn't go to your class. Uh, so the situation is you've done the adjustments to get to a, more of a true uh, income stream. And then your question was if you need to impact your risk rate because you've got sort of this risk. I mean, it seems to me that if your concern is that you've actually understated the, the income stream for the business, um, because maybe there's other things that you couldn't capture. There's just sort of this part of it you couldn't get your arms around. Um, by adding additional risk, you're going to just further understate the value of the company. So I, I, I'm sort of with Karen. I don't think I would add any additional risk because I think you're overcorrecting in the wrong direction at that point. Yeah. Um, I mean, we recently had a case along those lines where uh, we it was a cash business, and we all know how that goes, right? Um, and we also had no level of comfort with the expenses that the business is reporting. And so in those cases, you know, we did our best to figure out what the, the unreported cash income was and then decided that it wasn't a, a company that we could apply any type of a cap rate to to come up with a value and had to look at industry um, transactions and comparable transactions and apply a revenue multiple. And so that's, you know, maybe another way you can sanity check yourself is to look at those market transactions and what you're looking at to see to, to decide if you need to adjust your cap rate for anything. Yeah, good question. Okay, I'm going to go back to the theme of um, practice development here. Mo I won't ask for a show of hands, but many people here do this work part time or something less than full time. Let's just say that they're in the transition. All right, people are raising their hands. How many of you do it less than full time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of you. How many of you would like to do it full time? Okay. Um, Wait. All right, we'll go to the next question. No, was it different before you got here and you heard something <laughs> that scared you away? Yeah, don't be scared away. Why don't you guys, if you would, talk to us about that transition because it's something that we, we've all gone through sure. of transitioning from doing this because somebody threw us some work, finding out we like it, whatever, and then moving to full time. What words of wisdom do you have for them on, on making that happen and whether they should make that happen? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think sometimes people say, well, if you're not doing this full time, then you can't possibly be doing a good job at it. And I, I sort of disagree with that statement fundamentally, because I think you can be doing a good job with it if you're doing the right things. Um, and I'll sort of 
talk about that when I talk about my path. I mean, I started out doing traditional tax and audit work. I worked for a boutique firm in Toledo, Ohio. Um, I worked. I started out working for Garth Tebe, who I'm sure a lot of you know. And um, you know, I mean, I was I was probably doing you know at first 10 percent of my time was working on valuations, and then 20 and 30. And and as that happened, I had to shift away some of my tax clients. Um, and I, what happened that sort of was the tipping point for me, though, that made me decide that I had to sort of go all in on this, is there does get to a point in your career where you have to sort of be the leading expert on something. You can't, you know, you can't stay and be the partner on tax, and um, at least I couldn't for the type of book of business I was handling. I couldn't be an expert on tax and audit and valuations without feeling like I was juggling too many balls. Um, so I think, you know, the things that I did early on when I was trying to balance primarily a tax practice and, and valuation and litigation um, was, you know, I, I read everything I could get my hands on, you know, I, I, and so, yeah, it does take a little bit more time, so I was, you know, taking, uh, you know, the valuation examiner and other periodicals home with me at night and reading those in front of the TV so that I wasn't missing anything. I subscribed to a lot of newsletters. It's probably easier now. I mean, that was like 20 years ago when I was trying to balance that. It's probably easier now giving like electronics to be able to get like news alerts and make sure that articles that are important and then LinkedIn and following blogs. Um, but, you know, during that transition period, I think it's really about staying educated, staying current, coming to training like this, you know, once a year to make sure that you're going and hearing all the things that are happening. Um, and then you just sort of hit this natural tipping point in your career, I think, if you are trying to transition to it, to do it full time. And that's what I did. I actually just uh, made a change in firms at about eight years into my career and moved to a firm where I had the opportunity to kind of go all in on the consulting. Um, and it was a lot easier after that, after that to keep up with everything. I didn't have to worry about the tax rules and what was happening in valuation. Um, but no, I definitely think you can do a good job, even if your practice isn't 100%. It's just you've got to have, do a little bit more work. And, and the other thing that I did during that time period, I was very lucky to have a really good partner in my practice. You know, Garth was a great resource for me while I was working there. When I made my move to my current firm, GBQ, I didn't have a, a partner who was doing litigation work. So I didn't, and I wasn't doing 100% litigation work when I first moved to GBQ. I was still doing traditional valuation, which was a very comfortable space for me. And then I was doing litigation work, was, which was a little bit less comfortable of a space for me. So on that type of work, I had really great people with inside NACVA that I could reach out to and you know bounce my questions off of. So I think that's the other thing you really have to have is a really good resource and network of smart people um, that you can reach out to when you sort of aren't sure you get stuck in a, in a bind. That, that, that's the big part that I would recommend to you is to not be scared off by uh, the amount of information that is out there and maybe that you feel like you don't have your, uh, your hands on that or, or it, it's scary to venture into that because uh, one of the things that NACVA is good at is, is creating relationships uh, with people that you, you know, that are attending conference that will go to courses with you. Um, there are people that will help you to answer questions and to help you kind of develop relationships with people that can help. I, I would recommend that you take it slowly, uh, meaning uh, don't go all in on, I do appraisals and I do, you know, damage calculations and I do forensic accounting and I do because there's so many subspecialties now and you're seeing it as you attend this conference uh, this week because you're seeing that there's you know business appraisals there's there's more I attended I attended your session oh, thank you yes I know you did <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, damage calculations, et cetera. And, and, and there is a wealth of knowledge, more so now than there ever has been, I think, in each of these areas. So, uh, so you wouldn't want to jump in on all of them, but certainly to put your, your feelers out there, say, for instance, I think that most of you that are CPAs uh, have the, the, court, the, the session I just taught, the forensic accounting. A lot of what we do for that is common CPA knowledge um, that you guys already have. You just haven't had to hone it in and, and, and use your skills in certain ways that we use it for in forensic accounting. So you go take some courses, uh, read some books, but the, 
and I'm not just saying this because I teach for NACPA, but we have some excellent training courses that you can go and get the skills, for instance, to start forensic accounting. Um, how many of you who raised your hands that said you weren't, didn't want to do this, do you already have your business valuation credential? Lots of nodding heads. Some, yeah, you do. Okay, so you already know how to do that. Adding, for instance, forensic accounting to that because you're already doing the business appraisals, you know, go get the education there. And that's a natural thing to go out into. Um, I think the calculation of damages is a, a bit different. It's, it's something that, you know, that, that maybe you, you, you wouldn't want to do that now, maybe venture into that a little bit later. Um, and, and just get a feel, you know, go to the conference like you're doing and maybe take some more courses and get a feel for what part of it, what specialty it is that you really like and then start putting your feelers out. Get some connections with people here. You know, the instructors are generally pretty approachable uh, for questions. A lot of us are super busy too, but, and we do get back to you. It's not normally that day, but it can be, you know, soon. But we all take pride in responding to you guys and, and moving forward, but, but take it slowly and get the education and make sure you're comfortable in the certain areas that you want to branch out into. And eventually, if you like doing this and you're good at it, you will be doing it 110% of the time because there is work for that and that, you know, you, you probably do have the skill set that could be successful at this. Well, and we don't want to forget that this, is, this work is a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. It, it really is. And if you enjoy it, you should probably uh, think about doing it full time. Because um, it's way more fun than tax returns and financial statements. Um, <laughs> let me follow up on that and ask you this. There's uh, folks who are gurus in this industry who say you should specialize. Pick an area, be excellent, stay in your lane. Um, then there's other people like me who say, are you kidding? Um, I love picking up work I've never done before because it makes life a little more interesting. Um, where do you guys land on that? I, I, I would disagree with you. Okay. Um, only in that. Um, Good, I like that. And maybe because uh, because my practice has become more litigious than it used to be, and, and not anything that that I've done or, or seeked out. But I think one of the trends, and I'd be interested to hear what the two of you have to say about this, is one of the trends I'm seeing is that that my cases are becoming more litigious, and I think the reason for that is a lot of people are resolving their cases. Uh, there, there is a lot more knowledge out there on the internet. There is a lot more ability for people to do things themselves than there ever was. And so a lot of the simpler cases, I think, are, are resolving or settling without our services. Um, and the ones that, that I tend to get involved in are more litigious. So what does that mean when it's more litigious? And I don't want to scare you off. When you but, say litigious, let's define that. Are you saying they're more contentious? More contentious and okay. more often going to litigation than they did Because there's more money involved. Uh, you know, not necessarily. Okay. It, it's it, What I'm finding, and again, I'd be interested to hear from the two of you, is that the cases um, aren't necessarily more, or it's just the easier ones are settling without getting people like us involved. And, and the lawyers are doing it or their staff are doing it because the people coming out of law school now are a little bit more able to maybe do some of the simpler things we used to do. So we have the harder things. So um, if, if you have more contentious cases that are more likely to go to trial, then you're going to end up in this world of, you know, where people are trying to find everything that's wrong with every single thing you've done and your background. And you're obviously always going to be monitoring those things. But um, if you're venturing into something that you don't know anything about or that you're new in, I would hate to venture into something that you're just not ready for. Sure. So I really advise, like I said a few minutes ago, that you kind of add a, a, a practice area at a time and really think twice about something new that comes in the door that you've never done before that, you know, um, you can get one of us to help you or you can read about it, but you've never done a damage calculation and Rebecca's on the other side of your case, you're going to get... Oh, well, I'm going to run too from that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, it, you know, and, and then you would never want to do this again. So, um, you know, just I would say that to be to do it a little more conservatively and slowly, and you know, add the forensic accounting, add things, you know, slowly, and be extra careful when it's something you've never done before. So you're saying go slow, be careful, 
but you're saying don't necessarily specialize and only do one kind of deal. Well, I would say do it, do it one at a time. Yeah, add right. it, feel comfortable with it, then feel like you can venture out. Yep. Then you feel like you can add something else. But but to open up your your put your shingle out there and say I do everything and get a phone call that says oh well can you do a patent infringement damages case and then the next call is oh can you do a tracing in a family law case. Um, each one of those is, you know, has its own, you know, body of knowledge and information that that someone like us is might could be on the other side of. And uh, I would I would okay. recommend being more careful and okay. and thoughtful about it. But. My answer is it depends. You can't say that. I know, I know. Isn't there like doesn't Hitcher have a rule about that? Yeah. Doesn't he yeah. Like, throw something at you? Um, here's what I would say about specializing versus not specializing. Um, it, it, it really does depend on what we're talking about. Um, I think patent IP damages is a great example of something that is incredibly complex and it is a tough area to get your opinion accepted in anyways. So if you're a little bit more of a generalist, you may not want to put patent IP damages in your general Rolodex if that's not something you're doing a lot of. Um, but I think I think it's, it's actually really great from a standpoint um, to be able to say, look, I do valuations for lots of purposes. Sometimes those purposes are litigation. Now, I don't have that advantage, and I'll tell you how it disadvantages me. I only do litigation work. So I only do damages, fraud, forensic, and valuations in a litigated context because uh, in our consulting group, that's how uh, my partner and I have broken it up, and he handles all the valuations for fair value, estate, and gift. I spend a lot of time in, in depositions sort of having to defend the fact that all I do is work in litigation. Um, so there are pros and cons to specializing. On the other hand, I get a lot of a complex litigation cases that I don't think I would get otherwise if I was a little bit more of a generalist. So I, I don't think there's a hard and fast answer to this. I think it's perfectly fine to be a little bit more of a generalist so long as you're strategic and smart about what that pot looks like and that there's services that make sense together. And just know that there's also some some cons of being you know highly specialized and you know only doing contentious work. Yeah, just keep in mind that when you value a business, you're looking for two things. You're looking for a benefit stream and a risk rate. And in damages case, lost income, you're looking for what? A benefit stream and a risk rate. There you go. <laughs> and and when you're valuing patents, what are you looking for? Benefit stream and a risk rate. And so I just want to encourage you, I think Karen's um, admonition is very wise, go slow, be careful, but I just want, you know, I get a lot of phone calls throughout the year from, I'll say from you, from people inside NACFA members, and they want me to help them on a case. And 10 times out of 10, what I, my answer to you is gonna be, you need to do this, you can do this, you, I, I can help you, I'm not gonna do it for you, but I think you should walk away from a conference like this encouraged about what you can do not discouraged about what you can't do because there's all these other smart people that do it better and and they make it sound so mysterious folks this work is not mysterious it's not easy all the time but you're looking for a benefit stream and a risk rate um, and obviously there's other things you add on to that um, i would want you to walk out of here um, more challenged to take that work um, than afraid of taking that work and sometimes i know when i was coming up through through the ranks, I'd, I'd walk out of a session like this or a week like this with my knuckles dragging on the ground going, I, I just can't run with these people. Um, that's probably still true, but at least I've fooled myself that I think <laughs> I can. And I'm gonna try and fool you too. We have a question, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the first, the first uh, question in a deposition is do you promise to swear, or do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Right. But the advice that you typically get from every expert, college professor, or lawyer even, is to limit your testimony, which is not exactly the whole truth, really. I mean, how do you guys handle that dynamic whenever you're doing Good question. So, so I think you can tell the whole truth without being cagey about it. There's, there's, there's the whole truth in how much you explain is sort of the difference and it depends what you're trying to accomplish in a deposition right too so i usually have a conversation with the attorney before the deposition to sort of ask how they want me to handle some of those open-ended questions right so if someone asks you an open-ended question you kind of have two options in the way that you can answer it 
um, you, you can answer it truthfully and fully, or you can answer it truthfully and fully and basically kick that door open and walk through them and give them the lecture of a lifetime. Um, seriously, right? And both of those are honest, full answers. One's a little bit more brief and to the point, and one is, goes on, you know, goes on and on and on and educates the other attorney. And so I think when people are giving you that advice, like to try and limit your answers, I'm never giving that advice, like to limit your answers and not tell the whole truth. If I'm giving someone that advice about, you know, be brief, you, you want to be careful in depositions too, not to create a sound bite that they can then use against you in a motion in limine. So I think a lot of times you're probably getting that advice is, is, you know, don't just go on and on and on like I am right now and um, <laughs> create a sound bite that they can use against you. But sometimes it also depends on the objective of the deposition. So sometimes the attorneys know that it's going to go to trial and they don't want to create a, a, tr a tremendous record. And so they say, look, I want you to keep your, I want you to be honest. I want you to answer the questions fully, but I want you to keep the answers tight. And then other times they know they've got a good position and they really want you to take the time to educate the opposing counsel. And so to me, that's a little bit of a strategic decision in terms of what the attorney, what your side's trying to accomplish with your deposition. And you still have to be honest and fully answer the question, but sort of to what length you go is, is more of a objective type of thing. I, 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 I like that question. I have really in a few years thought about that correlation that, that, that you know, you are, you are saying that you will tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, because what happens in a deposition is uh, you have to be really careful to listen to the question that they are asking and not answer beyond what they're asking. So most of the time it is a yes or no, I don't know, or you know, this is the, this is the answer. Um, the the open-ended questions, um, one, don't usually get answered, or two, they, they're not asked in a way that you can answer. So I would say on a practical, on a practical level, you're probably not um, telling them everything you know, but only because that you are only there to answer the question that's being asked of you, and they're not asking you for everything you know about everything. So, um, so yeah, the advice most of the time is only answer the question. In fact, if you don't answer the question, that they've asked you, they could object and say, she's not answering the question. Um, so, so it is very narrow. So there is a little bit of a conflict there, but it's only because you're just answering the question that's being asked of you. Yeah, it's, it's their deposition. You're not there to impress them with how smart you are. You're not, your only obligation and goal is to answer their questions. And um, I think if you keep that in mind, you don't worry about what they're not asking you. You worry about what they are, and then you let the attorneys deal with, with all the rest. But, but you are there to educate. Not necessarily. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying you, the case could settle before that, and so oftentimes you don't get a chance to say what you need to say. Yeah, but Rebecca made a great point. Sometimes that is the objective, and sometimes it's not the objective. You have to let the attorneys work that out. There's some cases where the attorneys know this thing's not settling. There's a lot of times when we go into deposition and they tell you, if you... Depending on how you do here, um, this case will settle or it won't settle. And then the case settles and you always wonder, was it because I didn't do well or I did do well? <laughs> right. Um, right. But yeah, you, you can't go in with an agenda to a deposition. Yeah. You, you've got to go in with a handle on the facts and let them ask you what they're going to ask you. Sure, your, job is, you, your job is to educate when you're doing your direct testimony yes. in trial. Your job yeah. is not to educate the other in a deposition unless you've been specifically asked to educate the other attorney because you think you've got a good position and that attorney doesn't get it. Otherwise, your objective in a deposition is simply to answer the question. And be truthful. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you. Good thank questions. You. I'm so glad you did this. Why? You said you were afraid of doing this. <laughs> it's not public knowledge. Okay. It is now. <laughs> So my question goes back to our previous discussion about basically being a jack of all trades or specializing. And I come from a, I'm a CPA tax world. And I see that there might be some difference when you're talking about specializing or not taking all the jobs. When we look at tax and audit, you know, somebody might specialize in um, estate work 
or the auto industry or manufacturing or whenever you're doing audits you might be government or um, ESOPs what have you but listening to the conversation that you all just had in this context it sounded like really you're talking about funneling all your energy in the type of work not really the industry so so d do you understand what my question yeah. is because yep. there's a Good within question. the industries there's there's different um issues with each within each industry right. so are we falling back on our industry research to cover that but within that certain type of gift and estate work or litigation work. Or That's a good question. Well, maybe, maybe let's, let's categorize it in terms of business appraisals. Um, I, I think if you have a business appraisal credential and you, you can pretty much do any industry you want to do, um, and you do supplement your knowledge with industry research, and maybe if you need to, if it's very specialized and you want to talk to an industry expert, but with, with the business valuation training, I, I don't know of any limitation that you have in any industry that, that you could go out and do that. I think what we were more talking about is that there's business appraisals and then there's kind of the, the stuff that, that, um, that Rebecca does, the, the damages. For instance, personal injury cases, those are uh, sort of easier to do, but, but if you were to do one and you've never done one before, um, I don't know that you'd know the proper work-life expectancy or the life expectancy or where you would get this information from to, to draw, to do research. You know, I just don't, and, and I know people that do those a good percentage of the time. I, you know, I used to do those. I don't really do them anymore because I, I you know, I just don't. So, so that's where I think we were talking in terms of services. Yeah, we're talking about specializing in services, not industries. That's kind of how yeah. we look at those la the lanes that Chris is talking about, or service lanes. Basically. Yeah, if you guys are business valuation credentials, you, I don't. Would any of us say there's any limitation? I don't think from an is. industry perspective. From an industry perspective, no. And I'm actually. I mean, we deal with that in depositions, right? I mean, Chris, how many times have you been asked, like, have you ever valued a company in this industry, this specific tiny little niche industry before? And usually, when it's that specific, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And I'm totally comfortable with saying no because the the techniques that you're taught as a business valuator, part of that is getting up to speed on the industry and understanding the industry. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be able to tell the story. I just gave a deposition last week where they took me through that whole thing in deposition. Have you ever? valued an apple farm before no i've never even visited an apple farm before <laughs> um but you just have to remember you have to tell the story you have to make sure they understand you're an expert in valuation not an expert in apple farming <laughs> and once you cross the line you start trying to present yourself as an expert in apple farming you're in trouble because um, you're not you are an expert or, or car dealerships or whatever um, you're an expert in valuation and um you just, in that sense, stay in your lane. So you, you aren't limited by industry. The one exception I might say to that is there's been kind of a, an isolation of medical, the medical yeah. world, uh, because that's become so highly regulated. And, um, you know, that, that is a, an area where there's been dramatic change. And I know I don't do a lot of medical because I don't want to deal with all that. But that's more a decision of I don't want to deal with it than that I can't deal with it. Well, I was actually coming up here to just explain to you how I would eat your lunch if you were doing a medical valuation in certain areas, right? because I have 20 years of experience in medical specifically only, and there's lots of data we'll have that you won't. There's lots of what? A lot of data that we will have from our practices that you won't have, and if you make a mistake, like for instance on a cardiology practice, if you don't know when uh, there were cuts in reimbursement rates, if you don't know those dates, you don't know how to look up the CPT codes and all that kind of stuff, you're going to be at a big disadvantage. It's true. I'm glad I said that right before you said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was sort of uh, serendipitous because I was going to say something similar on the litigation side. Um, I only do health care. And so <clears throat> I'm always asked, do you only do litigation support? And I say, no. Matter of fact, I probably do closer to 60% of the consulting and helping them in, in the weeds of the operations and the coding and the compliance. So it's interesting to hear, um, Rebecca, for you, for example, to talk about that you only do litigation, because I think in our field, this healthcare, 
um, it would be a question of whether, how can you know the things that go on in uh, losses and damages? If you don't sure. understand that industry. Mm -hmm. Now, we're probably not alone. I would guess that maybe oil and gas or some of the others where there's some very peculiar kind of things going on. And um, I know on the other side, I run across people in, in litigation that have just never, you know, they just miss the nuances. So that's just a point I sure. like to make. Yeah, good point. Let me ask you guys something um, about litigation. Um, do standards and your credentials matter to the court? Do the courts care? I have a great story about this. You know, attorneys get really pumped up about when you say that you think another expert maybe hasn't followed their standards. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Yeah. And the, the problem I always have with this whole standards thing is, you know, it might be a silly standard that you blew, and it, and it probably just doesn't even have any impact on your conclusion. So I literally had a case where I think the person blew a standard, um, but it, sort of did, it was sort of a standard that did not matter. I'm telling you, these attorneys were like salivating over it and wanted it to be like the main focus of my report when I thought it really wasn't more than a footnote. Um, but, and, we, and we battled quite a bit about it, and I agreed to take it out of a footnote and make it my last opinion. Um, but the interesting thing that I sort of came to the realization of partway through the, the, the conversation with them is that, you know, in this case, the person that they wanted to read it was the judge. The judge is an attorney, and attorneys seem to really care about people who don't follow their standards. So I do think the standards is a really big deal. I think the credentials to the court is you have to have enough of them to be qualified, but there becomes a tipping point where enough is enough and it just sort of doesn't matter. So, you know, I, I know people would be like, well, I'm a CVA and I'm a this and I'm a that. Do I need to get these two others as well? I think generally, so long as the credentials you have are appropriate for the work you're doing, you have enough experience that three or five or seven, you know, doesn't make a difference. I, I would definitely agree with everything Rebecca said. I, 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 I think that, um, adding more letters behind your name and both of us all all of us have a lot of them behind our name <laughs> um, means that you do have to know the standards that that relate to that organization that you just got that credential from so it adds to um, the amount of standards that you have to be following on a daily basis um, but I, I think the question, Chris, you asked um, credentials are important and I think particularly for a business appraisal my opinion is if, 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 and what I've seen is if you're doing a business appraisal, you better have a credential of some sort. Um, just having a CPA is, is not enough for a business appraisal. But the other types of work we do, um, I, I, I don't know that it's as important, but I know that it is important to attorneys. It is important to judges. They do like to see those credentials. I get a few cases a year, every year, from my CFE credential. Oh, you're a certified fraud examiner and this person isn't? Okay, we're going to hire you for this fraud case. Um, and, and certainly the, the, the CVA, the, the, the MAFF that I have, um, you know, NACA NACA does spend a lot of time and money uh, making sure those credentials have a good understanding, a good following. So I know that those always have a good... Like, oh, okay, you're one of those. So, so they are important. They are very important. And it will help you when you're new to get some sort of level of recognition, and they do look at that. Yeah, we're talking a lot here about litigation. Let me say something about the IRS. I don't know if anybody here works with the IRS. I've been told by IRS folks that they're like opposing counsel. The first thing they look at in your valuation report is your CV. <laughs> they want to know who you are, what your training is, what your experience is. That's the first thing they look at because that is how they calibrate how to take whether they take your conclusion of value seriously. And that's true in a litigation setting. So um, just just be aware of that. Let me turn the corner. Nobody's um, asking questions, so I you get to. One. You got one, Chris. We do. Yeah, okay. I, I was kind of kind of resting there. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's getting uh, late in the conference. We're kind of letting our hair down a little bit. And uh, earlier in the conference, somebody uh, quoted from uh, Cool Hand Luke, and I forget which, uh, which quote it was, but it reminded me of another, and that is that uh, uh, a man's got to know his own limitations. Uh, 
I'd like to tell you just a little bit about, about a case, and and because uh, I think this goes to the point of what we're talking about, and and uh, and, and the panel can tell me if I'm uh, if I'm an idiot for the way I handled this thing or if it was genius, but uh, the lady a moment ago was talking about one of the complex areas, oil and gas specifically. Mm -hmm. I was engaged on a case; it was a legal malpractice case where the law firm was sued for tens of millions of dollars by an oil and gas company. And, uh, and the complaint was, was fairly vague. So I was given thousands of pages of documents to review. And so I got myself uh, educated on impairment of reserves and that sort of thing. But after some time, it, it, uh, uh, it dawned on me that, that uh, what this law, the law firm that engaged me, what they really needed was somebody who was really spun up and had a lot of hands-on experience in hedging transactions. I learned that there were many different kinds of hedging transactions. So I went back to the law firm and I said, I think we need another expert, maybe besides me, maybe instead of me. And I told them what I, I thought we needed. And they said, can you help us find that person? And so I said, well, I'll try. So I did find a person who was, who was formerly a CFO of an oil and gas company. And it turned out that, that uh, there was much more to, uh, uh, to hedging than, than I ever knew or would have known. And so basically I probably worked myself out of a job, but I felt pretty good about it. Um, any comments on, on that? Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I think absolutely. Really well that's, done. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's smart. I mean, that's exactly how you should handle that situation, in my opinion. We all have similar stories, probably, where yeah. we substitute ourselves out. We just go, we're not, we're, we're not what you really need, and we're, and that's a huge service to that law firm. Huge yeah. service, and they'll call you. I mean, you just created oh, yeah. instant loyalty because instead of doing them a disservice and doing a crappy job, you know, you got them the right person to help them with their case. That's a, that's a great story one of the most uncomfortable things you'll feel and i hope you you never feel it is when you're going to testify on something you don't really know about and you feel like you got pushed into doing something that you weren't qualified to do and maybe you issued something that you're not that comfortable on and you're about to go that that's just a feeling you never want to have and and you did the best service to to that client by by saying, I think there's somebody better that would do a better job than I would. Yeah, okay. To shift conversation to a question, could you talk a little bit about when you do use the weighted average cost of capital and when you don't? It's something that I struggle with when it's appropriate. I cannot, no. <laughs> I, you want me to? Why don't you start with that, Chris? Yeah, weighted average cost of capital in my practice is something that's used almost exclusively when you're talking about um, mergers and acquisitions, um, transactional valuation, because that's how that world operates. Um, they are looking to optimize um, debt and equity. And usually when you have a buyer, they have a, an idea of what that balance is gonna be. When you have a seller, they know what it is. Um, the danger is in a fair market value engagement where you're called on to value the business as you find it. When I see a valuation report using weighted average cost of capital, uh, typically what I'm seeing is they're trying to optimize debt and equity and they're no longer valuing the business as they found it. They're moving off the fair market value standard to more of a strategic value. And that's not exclusively true. There's uh, probably a lot of people here that all their valuations are weighted average cost of capital. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they're not moving off that fair market value standard. But in my experience, when I see that in an opposing expert's report, I'm gonna look very carefully at it. And very often I'm finding that they're um, doing a strategic value, not a fair market value. I will tell you in, in almost all of our, uh, up there, uh, in almost all of our valuations, um, so we're doing them for some type of a disputed purpose. So either in a family law context or shareholder dispute, um, you know, I'm looking at what my value would be doing, you know, a direct to equity calculation versus the weighted average cost of capital, because I want to make sure that I'm going to come out with somewhat the same answer and use the actual capital structure instead of a hypothetical or max, maximized capital structure like Chris was talking about, um, because I want to make sure that I'm not subject to being you know beat up on the other side of this and it's a super easy calculation to do i just kind of run them side by side see where i end up and if, and if i've got the right capital structure on the weighted average cost of capital i should come out with some pretty similar values and at the end of the day if you're using the actual capital structure it shouldn't in theory right it shouldn't matter right. so in litigation i usually run those side by side 
to make sure that I'm not doing something where Chris Hamilton's going to pick up my report and say, nice try, you jacked up the value on purpose by using you know, the optimal capital structure. I almost never see anyone use WAC in my practice. It's just not, it depends upon your practice area, but it's rarely used. You know, the other, the other area, one other thing to say on that, um, I use WAC when I'm valuing an intangible asset. I, I think of a case, a restaurant in Hollywood where they had an easement, um, the neighbor shut off the driveway, that was the exclusive parking area. I was brought in um, to value that easement. In other words, what, what was the value of access to the restaurant? Um, it's a great example of you have to know your weighted average cost of capital to find out what your cost of, of or your um, risk rate is on your intangible assets. So that's another application of WAC where it's very, very helpful. Um, if that is helpful to anybody, there it is. Um, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. I think it's a good topic. And I was wondering if you thought, you know, when you get smaller companies, like maybe uh, manufacturing companies or any companies doing maybe 10 million in revenue and down. Um, do you think it really makes a lot of sense to be using an invested capital uh, approach? I mean, those companies, they don't really optimize their capital structures. They borrow money when they have to borrow money. And secondly, uh, it, it's not really debt. It's, 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 it all comes with personal guarantee. So, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any magic there. Um, that, you, that, you, that, that you might try to create when you're on an invested capital basis for smaller companies. So I just, I, I'd be interested in what you all thought about that. I think we agree. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. I think yeah. that's a, yeah, I agree a with you. valid observation, which is why I get concerned with valuation firms where they don't do a valuation on anything, even a, a $100,000 a year business without using WAC. It, it just, um, it's overkill. It's kind of wacky. It's wacky. It's <laughs> wacky. Yeah. Good one. All right. We just have a few minutes left. Maybe we can leave you, maybe we can all leave with one practice tip that we would want to tell everybody. Well, it's your idea, so you get to go first. That's how that works. <laughs> <laughs> we did not prepare that in advance, but I just thought it would be good to leave you guys tonight with maybe one recommendation yeah. that we have that, uh, that we've learned in our years of practice. And I guess mine would be um, going towards uh, Billing collections, things like that, is is never underestimating a retainer, never underestimating your value, and always keeping an eye on that. And and I know that at some point we all have write-offs, we all have situations that didn't, you know, for some reason we can't collect. Hopefully you don't have that. I hope. Is there anyone out there that collects 100% of their receivables? I'd like to talk with you, but 90%. Oh, good. Well, see, Chris is get good. retainers up him. front. Work yeah. off of retainers. That that's a you know that's something that you need to really focus on. Um, is is just your retainers, your billing, making sure that you're getting paid for what you do, and that you're you're keeping an eye on that because we get so busy in doing the actual work that sometimes we forget, you know, that 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 that's really. And it's not it we 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 want to do a good job and we do what we do because we like what we do and we want to help people, but. But keep an eye on that and, and don't be shy about retainers and billing and don't be afraid to, to make sure you get paid for what you do. That's good. We don't, release, we don't release reports. We don't go to trial unless we're fully paid. I mean, I've, I've been like telling someone I'm going to get off the plane if I don't get a call from my accounting department because I'm not coming to trial if that money's not in our account. And uh, that's a very effective strategy to get yourself paid. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to give sort of a specific practice tip for any of you that are sort of thinking that you want to get into litigation, but you're not exactly sure how to. Uh, so, when I first wanted to get into litigation, there's this sort of catch-22 about litigation. Is uh, attorneys will say like, "Have you ever testified?" And you say, "No, I've never testified." And then they say, "Well, okay, then I guess we're going to use someone else." And so it's that sort of like how do you get your first testimony if you don't have any testimony? Um, so there's a couple ways that I think we've been successful with getting the uh, for, to first testimony for some people. Pro bono cases are great, and NACVA has a uh, initiative around that. A lot of times the pro bono cases are very simple, and my, uh, my, my number two is getting her first testimony on a pro bono case, um, hopefully. We don't want them to settle. 
yeah. Right. And then the other way, and the way I got my first testimony is I took a smaller piece of a larger project with a partner, and I got to testify about a very, a very small, limited scope. But I had been the one who had done all the work, had all the knowledge, and did it. So I testified about a pretty limited issue, and then he testified sort of about the bigger issues. Um, so you can think about that if you're trying to develop someone younger than you too, to sort of fill in your shoes. Uh, there's ways to get them, you know, that experience that's so critical. And we're right at six o'clock, so if you want to know what I have to say, you can talk to me afterwards. <laughs> I know you don't. Thank you, Rebecca Thank and you. Karen, and have a good evening. Good job.